All rise. This court's now back in session. All right. We are ready now to take up the matter of the estate of Robert Herman Harrell. And <clears throat> what we have, based on my review of the file, is, is that um, we are here today for dealing with the request for declaratory or, or uh, actually an interpretation of provisions of the testator's will regarding the disposition of the estate. Is any either side wish to make any sort of opening statement regarding this? Well, briefly, yes. All right. Unfortunately, we have a will that was drafted in Michigan, and that provides, I think, a little bit of difficulty because I don't believe that a will like this, I've never seen a will that's exactly like this in the state of Tennessee. It may be something that was done frequently in Michigan back in 1990 when this was originally drafted, but um, it's not something that we think is uh, specifically uh, up to par, in my opinion. Um, the will itself makes reference to uh, specific requests and things, and then makes reference to an interesting paragraph I've never seen before. I request, and this is in paragraph, uh, it's on page four, paragraph number seven, article seven of the will. I request that they honor any intentions with regards to the distribution of this property that I may have expressed prior to my death. Now that provision has to do with two or more beneficiaries, but we think that that was the intent of this testator. We think that he intended to do something because he repeatedly expressed desires to have certain things done with land, and he led his life in a way that he did that. And I'll tell you, Your Honor, what I mean. Um, our clients are the uh, children, in essence, of the decedent. The decedent, after this will was established, received real property, and they received it as a result of an estate in Michigan. That property was distributed in different ways, and we will show the court the deeds and admit those deeds. There was one provision um, deed that was made that transferred property to, my client, uh, the, to the decedent and his wife. The remainder of all of the other deeds were not directed in that way after marriage, after this will, but were directed towards only the decedent. The, the land was placed into their name. Now, the problem that we've got is we believe that the decedent, because of the manner by which he led his life and the things that he told the children, thought that by putting I request that they honor any intentions with regards to the distribution of this property that I may have expressed prior to my death had taken care of it. Yeah. That's really what we come down to here. We have significant difficulty because all of the property would pass outside or, or by the will to the wife, excluding the family members. The farm is one that has been in the family's name for, I want to say, over 100 years and uh, was never intended to be transferred this way, is, is our impression. Franklin. Good morning, Judge. I represent Ms. Lena Harrell, who is the decedent surviving spouse. There are a few, the issue seems to be, according to the, uh, the movements in this action, the construction of Article 7 of the decedent's last will and testament. Your Honor, Frankly, that, that provision isn't relevant to the disposition of the decedent's real property here, as the decedent in Article 6 of his last will and testament clearly left all of his residuary estate to his wife of 30 years. It's not unusual that most of the time individuals leave the majority of their estate to their surviving spouse. <clears throat> And in, our, in Section 2 of Article 6 of the decedent's last will and testament, he made provision in the event his spouse did not survive him. Then he wanted everything to be divided in equal shares among his, li among his, his living children. He made the provision 
in the event his wife predeceased him, which shows his intent was to give the re residue of his estate, including this real this real property that's at issue, to his surviving spouse. Um, Your Honor, Tennessee Code Annotated 32-3-101 states a will shall be construed in reference to the real and personal estate comprised in it in so to speak and take effect as if it had been executed immediately before the death of the testator. One of the arguments I believe that the opposing counsel is going to try to present today is that the decedent didn't own this farm at the time that he executed his last will and testament. We have deeds as well that showed he did not have absolute ownership of this farm at the time of his uh, at the time of the execution of his last will and testament. However, he did own 50% of it. He had a 50% interest at that point in time. He made no specific bequest that this real property go to his children. If it was his intention, he was a sophisticated, I'm sure you'll hear testimony, he was a sophisticated party. He bought and sold property pretty frequently throughout the, his lifetime. And if he wanted this property to go to his children, he could have done a few things. He could have executed a codicil that left this real property to his children. He could have executed deeds. He did neither. He left his 1990 will in place where he left the residue of his estate, including the Harrell family farm, to a surviving spouse. Thank you. Um, one, one, one dispute we might have there, the actual deeds to the property contested were not executed until 1992 after this deed was, after this will was prepared. Oh. Then you are the moving party, Mr. Olson. You may call your first witness. Call Mr. Harrell. Mr. Harrell Sir, would you state your name, please? Robert Eugene Harrell. And if you would, please, sir, tell your tell the court your relationship to the decedent in this case. He's my father. And just so we're clear, the decedent was Robert Herman Harrell. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And if you would, please, sir, tell the court where you live right now. I live in Brighton, Michigan. And where did your father live at the time that this will was drawn? Lavalle, Michigan. Yeah. If we can, sir, and I want to, I want to limit this as much as we can. If we can. How frequently did you see your father after? Well, let's say, when did your father move to Tennessee? It would have been right after my grandfather died. I was been, been uh, early, early to mid nineties, three, four, somewhere in there. And you were there, following. If you'll grab the base of that microphone and pull it towards you, so that, you know, there you go. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Let me let me ask you some background questions before we go on to what. What have you done? You're, are you retired now, sir? Yes, I am. What did you do during your productive life? I was a Michigan State trooper. Very good, sir. How frequently did you visit your father after he moved down here to Tennessee? Uh, once, twice, maybe sometimes three times a year, a minimum one time every year, a lot of times two times, occasionally three. Okay. Did you stay in contact with him? All the time. We don't have the phone all the time. We talked. Very good. And if you would, please, sir, let's talk a little bit about when this gentleman married this, his current wife. When was that you recall? Would have been right just before the will was ex executed. I'm going to guess 90. I'm just as a guess. I know it was right in there somewhere, 89, 90. Let's talk briefly, if we can, about the farm that seems to be an issue. If you would please describe what what the farm consists of, the the disputed land. Well, it was a property my great grandmother and great grandfather owned, and uh, my great grandfather died when I was probably 11 or 12. My great grandmother didn't die till I was 20. Uh, my when my great grandmother died, my grandmother was the daughter of my great grandmother and great grandfather, H. B. Wall, okay. Hattie Wall, and uh, because my grandmother was the oldest, they made an agreement with my granddaddy would buy the farm because they knew grandma would keep it in the family. Okay, and if you would please, um, if you would please, sir, uh, name everybody. If you just so that I understand who we're talking about. Grandmother. Oh, great grandfather was H.B. Uh, Wall, and Hattie Wall was my great grandmother. Okay. My grandmother was Edna Harrell, Wall Harrell, and my grandfather was uh, Henry Slayton Harrell. Very good, sir. 
And if you would please, let's talk about the farms again. How long have the, have the farms that are at issue in this case been in the family, your family? Uh, it, it, I believe it became a centennial farm in 1973. So that, but in 73, you'd owned it 100 years, right? 100 years, yes, sir. Stating the obvious there. But uh, if you would please, sir, tell the court what it consisted of, how many acres, what it was used for. Uh, it was a substance farm. My great grandfather raised uh, tobacco on it. He raised hogs, cattle, just a little bit of everything. Uh, when my grandfather got it, he let it grow up, to be honest with you. And then my brother, they bush hogged it down and cleaned it up uh, somewhat. And then uh, when dad moved down there, he really cleaned it up. I believe the original, what was left of the original, I, I believe it's 140 acres, roughly. And just so we're clear, there, there's a portion of that that is a very small portion of that in Montgomery County, correct? Yes, sir. And the, the majority of this land is all in Dixon, Tennessee, correct? Yes, sir. So it's in the county of Dixon? Yes, sir. Right, very good. Oh, no, sorry, no worries. Now, sir, if we can, um, there was an estate established in Michigan, is that correct? And that resulted in the creation of some deeds, is that correct? I, 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 no, the estate ultimately was established and deeds were, deeds were prepared transferring property to your father, correct? Yes. And would you recognize those if I hand those forward to you? Yeah, I could read them and look at them, I mean. May we pass these forward, John? You may. I recognize these. I'm going to hand you another deed that is a little bit different. It seems to be a quick claim deed uh, that was prepared. And you'll take a look at that one. some very specific questions to see if we can establish some dates and some times and things. The family farm, which is what we're talking about, is that correct? If I call it the family farm, you understand what that is, right? Yes, sir. And that consisted of 134.6 acres and 52.6 acres, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right, very good. And that was actually deeded to your, mo your mother and the decedent in 1992, is that correct? By those two deeds? Yes. And there's a, another deed that is uh, there that was prepared that was deeded, and if you would please, to Lena Harrell, the, but the wife of your father at this time. And does that reference a different kind of transfer? In other words, it's a transfer from the transferees to Lena, or to to Lena and your father. In other words, that was created. A deed was established to create an interest by Lena in that in that land. Correct. You're talking about where the house sits on yes. one less than two acres. Yes. 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 Right. Your Honor, we'd ask that these be perhaps a collective exhibit. You want a collective exhibit one? I think that would probably be appropriate. Yeah, There's one collective. Oh, just a moment. Very good. So we've got two deeds that do not include the Mrs. Current Miss Harold, the widow, and one that did, correct? Yes, sir. Now, if you would please, sir, I'd like to talk with you briefly about your conversations with your father. Did he express to you what he wanted to have it done with this form? Yeah, I'm going to object um, on the basis that parole proof of the intention of the decedent is not admissible for the construction of a will. There's multiple cases I can cite to if you'd like. It's articulated very thoroughly in section 419 of the Richards. All right, what was the question again? 
did he express what he wanted to have done with the, the land? And we would suggest it's, it's consistent with what the will said. Follow my instructions. And Ms. Franklin, you'll I'm turn your microphone because... over there on the table to make sure we're picking up what you're saying. Sure. I'm objecting um, because parole proof of the decedent's intentions expressed during his lifetime is not relevant to the construction of his last will and testament. I have several different cases that I could cite to if necessary. It is articulated very thoroughly in section 419 of the fifth edition of Pritchard's that the court is not to consider statements of the decedent's intentions in construing the language of his will. And you have that case law available. I know that you have submitted one case in particular that I have reviewed during my pre-trial review of the file that was the Hargis versus Fuller case. Do you have other cases that you're relying upon? I do, Your Honor. I have Ferris v. Bry Block Company, 208 Tennessee, oh, 346 SW2D705. That one's a 1961 case. This has been long established law in the state of Tennessee. I have Nichols v. Todd, 2010 Court Appeal, oh, 101 SW2486. Dixon v. Cooper, 12 SW4. Four, five. This has been a, a principle established, it looks like, going back to 1889, that the decedent's statements regarding his intentions expressed during his lifetime are not relevant for the construction of the last will and testament. Mr. Olson? Yes, we would suggest that uh, reference to, the, uh, to Pritchard's is appropriate, particularly Section 271, making declarations of the testator and missile. What are you referring to, Antonio? Pritchard's, Pritchard's on wills and estates, and then we'll get into some case law. Uh, but basically, Pritchard's identifies that the intention of the testator is paramount and must be examined in construing a will. And in this case, the problem that we have is we have a will that is inconsistent as a matter of law. I, again, I made reference to the fact that this is a Michigan, a Michigan will, and I don't think that I've ever seen anything like what we have in this will in the state of Tennessee. I want people to follow what I say. Now, what council wants to do is limit that paragraph, Article 7, to just if there are two or more beneficiaries, but that's not what it says. It says, I want people to consider what I said. And we think in that regard, it is a part of what he intended, and it is admissible when he thought that was going to be something that would be considered. And clearly that is something that the testator thought was going to be considered. There's also, I would refer you to In Ray Crow Crowell, when construing a will, the testator's intention must be ascertained from what is written in the will. And in this will, it says, if there's a dispute, you need to remember what I said. So that's kind of where it comes down. And respectfully, this is amb ambiguous. The interpretation is something that I think is unusual. Again, I make reference to that. This is an ambiguous clause. Harris versus France, 232 Southwest 2nd, allows the introduction of parole evidence to determine what it was that was intended by the testator. Judge, I would point to, um, again, if we're going to rely on Pritchard's, I would point to Section 408 in the 5th edition, which states as follows when construing provisions of a last will and testament, independent provisions not so connected must be construed separately. Even though there may be room for conjecture, the testator had the same intention in regard to all. So here, what opposing counsel is attempting to do is stating that the residuary clause, which comes before the provision that he is speaking of. What you're actually talking about is whether it is, is a different issue than what we're dealing with Correct. right now, which is whether or not it's admissible to allow the witness to testify about statements his father made prior to his death about his intentions regarding the property. <clears throat> and it, it is, uh, according to the case law that was submitted, for example, in the case that I cited, which was the Hargis versus Fuller case, the, uh, which is a 2005 <coughs> Court of Appeals uh, decision for the middle, uh, middle District, rather. And basically just citing some of the language in that case uh, and why I'm about to rule the way I am. A construction suit recognizes the testator's right to direct his disposition of his 
his or her property and thus limits the court to ascertaining and enforcing the testator's directions. The cardinal rule in construction, I'm omitting all the citations to other cases, cardinal rule in construction of all wills is that the court shall seek to discover the intention of the testator and to give it effect unless it contravenes some rule of law or public policy. The testator's intention is to be ascertained from the particular words used in the will itself, from the context in which those words are used, and from the general scope and purposes of the will, read in light of the surrounding and attending circumstances. So based on that, <clears throat> it would, and this is a non-jury matter, so therefore this court has to make this determination. I'm going to allow Mr. Olson to introduce this proof because it might have some relevance to the context in which the words in the will were used and the general scope or purposes of the will, but bearing in mind, as you have pointed out, that um, our case law, or not our statute, says that <clears throat> a will shall be under 32.3.101, as you cited, a will shall be construed in reference to the real and personal estate comprised in it, so as to speak and take effect as if it had been executed immediately before the death of the testator and shall convey all of the real estate belonging to the testator or in which the testator had any interest at the testator's decease upon a contrary, unless a contrary intention appears by its words or in, its words in context. So that's the construction I have to apply. I'm gonna allow him to introduce this evidence and I'll consider it and give it the weight that I think it appropriate. And I do so <clears throat> based upon this uh, citation, which is basically um, a citation that this uh, case had made to a Presley case at 782 Southwest 2nd, which says that I'm to ascertain from the particular words and the context in those words were used and the general scope and purposes of the will read in light of surrounding and attending circumstances. Erring on the side of caution, I'm gonna allow him to introduce that for the purpose of allowing a full disclosure of what the circumstances were, but I'm mindful of the fact that I have to read this will in, in light of that statute. Mr. Olson, I overrule the objection. You may continue. Very good, thank you, Your Honor. Tell the court uh, how frequently you would speak to your father about the farm and its final disposition. Well, we talked about every time it came down. I mean, we'd go out on his um, uh, buggy, he called it, a little uh, diesel go around. We'd go around the farm. And he'd show me the new fencing and how he changed up. Dad, Dad took really good care of that farm. So it was nicer than when great grandma, uh, great granddaddy had it. Yes, sir. But uh, basically, uh, we talked about he putting it into a trust. And I, I, I approached him on that where he could get paid for the uh, building fences and everything else. You just can't sell it or you can't improve it. You can only maintain it. And he looked into it, and then his biggest concern was if one of us, if something happened and we needed money, you know, me or my sisters or brother, we couldn't sell it. What was his intent happened to the four of them? Well, was to go to the four of us, uh, me, my brother Dale, my sister Sherry, and Don. Was it ever his intention that this 100-year farm be something that was divested from the family and placed in another person's name? No, never. Um, I'm drawing your attention again. You've read the deeds. Did your father have deeds prepared that specifically transmitted property to his wife and specifically excluded his wife? Well, the, the, the gist of the farm was just in his name and my grandma's at the end. Originally it was just grandma's and granddaddy's. Mm -hmm. Then it went, when granddad died, it went to grandma, uh, grandma and dad, or grandma, then did, grandma put dad on there. He broke off some property and built a house for him and uh, Linda. And I know the agreement on that because they talked about it many times, whoever dies, the other one inherits the house and the two acres or just under two acres. And that was by deed, correct? Yeah, yes, sir, and that, that was by deed. And he did this to show that we would still retain the farm. How many and how often was the discussion undertaken about the fact that he anticipated the farm would go by the will to you all? He just said it was gonna to go to us. You know, that was his intentions. He just wanted us to have it, and he wanted us to have it equally. Um, you know, me, Dale, Sherry, and Don. Was it his intent that it stay in the family? Yes, it was. And was that something that was done to try and exclude his wife, or did he feel like he had made appropriate provision for her with the house? Well, I'm, I've heard Linda talk about it with Dad. I was there, and we all talked about it. The farm was going to go to the kids, 
and that includes the old uh, farmhouse, the original farmhouse. Dad bricked it and made it a lot nicer, but the inside was trashed. And he was going to fix it up to have a place where we came down and we wouldn't have to stay in his house, we could stay in that house. And the last time we went down there, he put new carpet and everything else, but the renter he had in before it was a real heavy smoker and he, he didn't t clean them. I mean, the nicotine was brown on white. Yeah. And it, my wife couldn't, she could, couldn't stand it. And I, I mean, I could have slept there if I had to. But. Now, did you, were these conversations things that involved your father's wife? Oh, she was, she was there many times, yeah. Was she aware of and did she know of your father's expression with regards to the will? It was, with the, the farm? She said she didn't know there was any will or nothing, that's what she told me, but as far as the farm, that's why she always, every time we came down, at least once, she reiterated that she was going to get more acreage because she wanted five acres, not just the two, which I know is less than two, though. In other words, she indicated that what she wanted to do was not just get the two acres that surrounded her house, she wanted to get the five acres, is that right? Uh, to make it five acres total. Very good, very good. With regards to the farm itself, were there conversations that involved your father's wife, who is the beneficiary under the will right now, about the fact that this property was not intended to go to her, but was intended to go to you and your... Yes, as a matter of fact, when we came, when we came down here, when Dad uh, passed, we first time we came down here, we went down to the farm, and she met us outside. And Dad had got some renters into the to the farmhouse, and the first thing she told me says, "You know, the really good renters don't kick them out." You know, she made statements to many people that uh, the you know that Dad's kids didn't know how much money they were going to inherit. And that was said by her to you. She was yeah, she was right there when it, we talked about it many times. Yeah, just a moment, Your Honor. Yes. Nothing further. Well, I couldn't even cross the examiner. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Harrell, my name is Sydney Franklin. Um, I represent Miss Mrs. Harrell. I'm going to start by asking you just a few questions. Um, you stated that your father did not have an interest in this family farm until 1992. Is that correct? Well, he would have had an interest because it was going to go to him and me and my brother and, and sisters. I'm sure of it. Do you know if he had an interest in this property in 1985? Not, not that I was aware of, I believe. I'm not aware that he did. Do you still have Collective Exhibit 1 in front of you? No, oh, I do not. Pass that by. Okay. In Collective Exhibit 1, I want you to look at one of those 1992 deeds and compare. Do you know what the legal description on a deed is? I'm not a lawyer, so no. <laughs> Okay, it'll start with where it says beginning at a point in Barton's Creek. It's typically a narrower type. Right here, yeah. Okay, and do you see that in the 1992 deed? All right, that's in the One of those 1992 area. deeds that states beginning at a point in Barton's Creek. Well, it's in two spots here that I see. I mean, it's on the front page of this exhibit here. Okay, perfect. And then when you go inside here further, it's yes. also so says beginning at a point at Barton's Creek in the mouth of the spring branch. So you see that in the 1992 deeds. Now I'm going to direct you to the deed I just handed you from 1985. Do you see that same legal description there? Yes, I do. Okay, and let's talk through the derivation at the top or the conveyance at the top of this deed. Do you see on this deed where it looks like we have a number of individuals, Benny Hall, Edna Harrell, Cullum Wall, Van William Wall, do you recognize these names? Yeah, that's my uh, grandmother's brothers and sisters. Okay, does it appear that they conveyed a, a one half undivided interest to Henry S. Harrell and wife Edna Harrell as tenants by the t entirety? Do you see that in the 1985 deed that I handed you? I'm looking at it right now. Mm -hmm. Robert H. Harrell, yes. And then they upon his heirs and assigns forever. And they conveyed another one half interest to Robert H. Harrell. Yes, I see that. In 1985. Right. And when was your father's will written? 
uh, 90, 90 or 91. So he had a half interest in this farm at the time he executed his last will and testament, yeah, correct? Uh, I've never seen this one, so I guess if this is... You have the, never seen this? This one here, no. That wasn't introduced during your deposition? Well, if it did, I, I don't recall it. I've been under a lot of stress lately. Okay. So you don't remember this being introduced at your deposition, that he had a one-half interest in the property? I, I, don't, I don't recall it, but if you say it happened, it was recorded, I'm sure it's there. Okay. And does it appear to be recorded? I, was, I assumed it was recorded. Okay, Judge, I'd move to admit that as Exhibit 2. All right, mark it as Exhibit 2. So you've testified about statements that your father made that he intended for this property to go to his children, correct? Yes, I did. Your father bought and sold property pretty frequently throughout his life, didn't he? He bought some and sold some, yes. He was familiar with how deeds work and things like that. Well, he uses a title company. He doesn't do it himself. I mean, I understand. But he, he's bought and sold property before. Yes, he has. Okay. Did he ever execute a deed conveying the property to you and your siblings? No, he didn't. Okay. Did he add a codicil to his will in which he bequeathed the property to you and your siblings? Not that I've seen. Okay. When did you know your father had a will? I knew he had a will when he gave it to me back when he first had it made, and I put it in my safe and never gave it a second thought. Okay, so you knew he had a will. Do you remember when you originally filed for letters of administration in this court? When I was down here, yes. Okay, do you remember that you testified before this court that there was no will? I believe there was a second will, and it was in his safe in his house, and we were never allowed access to the house. I'm just going to ask you, did you knew that there was a will, and you testified before this court that there was no will, correct? I... I guess I did, yes. Okay, so why should the court believe you today? I guess I misspoke. I don't know. You misspoke? I must have. I don't okay. know. I don't, I, 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 maybe I just don't remember it. Okay, let's pass up your affidavit. Do you recognize this document? Yes, I do. Okay. Does it appear that it was filed with this court on June 22nd of 2022? Yes. Okay. And let's see. In paragraph 11 on the second page, it states, it is believed the decedent died in test state without a will. Is that your signature? I'd ask that yes, it is. Honor, I'd ask that she read the entire portion. Okay, I've searched diligently and have been unable to locate an original last will and testament. How did you search diligently? For a, for a different will or this one? For any will. What, what matters did you take to search diligently for an original will? Well, I looked through all the paperwork my dad gave me over the years. Okay. And I didn't find anything in there. My brother-in-law retired from General Motors, and he contacted them to find out about the wills that they get for free, legal mm -hmm. service, which is the will he had made. And General Motors lawyers, when they write them up, they don't keep a copy. They give the whole copy to the client, right. and there's nothing held. Okay. And your father did provide for you in his last will and testament, correct? Yes, he did. Okay. You received various items of personal property, correct? Yes, I did. Did he also leave you as the beneficiary on several CDs or on a CD? Well, I PODs, yes, me and my siblings. Yeah, so he left you as a beneficiary in those accounts. He provided for you, correct? Yes. Okay. Let's go ahead and I'm going to hand you a 1987 deed. No, that's okay. I'm sorry. I, I did not have moved to admit the affidavit as things have I'm going to give you a second to look over this will. And again, we'll start with the legal description just to make sure we're still talking about the same piece of property. Yes. Okay. Um, and this appears that it was executed on August 5th, 1987. Is that correct? Yes, it does. And does this appear that Henry S. Harrell and his wife, Edna Harrell, conveyed an interest in the property to Robert Herman Harrell and Sue Hughes? Correct? That's what it says, yes. Okay. 
So they, your father already had a one half share of this property, a one half interest in 1985. And then in 1987, he got another portion of the property. Correct? I guess if that's what this says. Okay. Judge, I'd like to move to admit that as exhibit three, the 1987 mm -hmm. deed. Look, is exhibit three. Do you agree that your father was a pretty sophisticated businessman? Well, he, yeah, I, he knew he had his interests and he was good at what he, his interests were. Okay. If he wanted to, he could have executed a deed to you and your siblings, correct? I suppose he could have. And he did not. As far as I know, he didn't. I have no further questions. Redirect. Uh, Your Honor, I'm going to ask to admit the affidavit that counsel did not want to admit so that we have a complete reflection of the fact that the affidavit did not reflect what counsel said. The affidavit says, it is believed the decedent died in test date. I have searched diligently and have been unable to locate an original last will and testament. Where did you find, where was the will and testament ultimately found? The, the original? Yeah. Uh, Linda, I assume, Linda came up with it, and I, I assume it came out of his big safe in, in the basement. It was your impression that there was another will too, is that correct? My father did lots of notes. He was very meticulous on things, and there's no doubt had we gotten access into that safe before she got into it, we would have found it. So it's your belief there was another will? It's my belief, yes. Why do you say that? Well, what my dad's always told me, my, you know, since as long as I can remember. And what was that? What did he tell <laughs> the you? Farm, he got the farm from grandma and granddaddy, and he was going to give the farm to his kids. Basically is how it goes. Let's talk about these deeds, if we can, just briefly. Uh, all of these deeds end up with him getting the farm. Is that correct? Yes. Now, some of these predate, I guess, him meeting this lady. Is that right? Yes, it looks like it. And there was nothing ever done except for with regards to one deed to vest her name in any property. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And I'd go through, you know, counsel had some interesting questions, and I agree with them. He was fairly sophisticated. Is that right? What he liked, his knowledge, he was, was very well informed. And if he had wanted to vest this lady with that property, he could have done it, couldn't he? Oh, yes, he could have. You think that uh, these deeds evidence that he knew what he was doing? I believe so. Okay. And with regards to that deed, again, was did you all discuss the provisions that you expect that what he says is going to happen? Rephrase that, please. Yeah, that was a poor question. I, did you all discuss with him and with this lady all at once that it was anticipated that this this land would go to you all? It was what he intended, correct? Yes, and she's aware of it. Three cross. Thank you, sir. You may step down. Mr. Olson, you may call your next witness. Uh, you said, you, is that the affidavit? Uh, he wanted to make it an exhibit, yes. I understood. Let's make that an exhibit if we can. Mark his exhibit four. Thank you for coming down today. If you would please state your name for the court. Melissa Hunter Harrell. And what is your relationship in this matter to these folks? Uh, the deceased is my father-in-law. Okay. Who are you married to? His son, Robert. Have you traveled to Tennessee to visit with the decedent before he passed away? Yes, we have. Okay. And did you engage in the conversations that uh, you heard your husband discuss? Yes. Have you, dis have you engaged in those discussions? I was present at most of them. Okay. 
Have you been present when there were conversations with this nice lady about these issues that we're discussing today? Yes. Okay. And if you would please tell the court what it is that the decedent would express with regards to the farm. He always expressed that the farm should go to his children and stay in the family. Was that something that was expressed in front of his wife? Yes, it was. And what did she express anything, anything when that would be expressed? No, she just mostly sat there and listened. If you would please, just so we're clear, um, tell the court where you would be and how you would have that discussion. I want to make sure that, for example, she didn't have her hearing aids in or something like that. But tell the court how and where that would be. Four of us would be in the living room in the evenings talking. And uh, in the morning, when we were having coffee, we were sitting in the TV room, living room, and would, conversations would come up. And during those conversations, what specifically was, ex was expressed by the, the decedent? That the farm would stay in the family, and he um, also always wanted to show us how he improved it. And did uh, his wife at that point participate? Did you ever, do you remember her saying anything in objection to that happening? No, she never objected. Were you present for any of the discussion related to the house in which the decedent and uh, the widow lived? Yes. Okay. Tell the court about that discussion. The, he dis, when they were getting ready to build the house, he wanted to deed off a certain part of the land so that Linda would have that if he died first, that she would have that land where the house sat. Was that was that discussed? Oh yes. And did did you you call her Linda? Did the widow engage in those discussions? Yes. And if you would please express, tell the court what was expressed and discussed. She was upset that she only got two acres, and she always said she wanted to get the five acres. If we can, when is the last time that you heard or engaged in that type of discussion with her? It would have been the fall before my father-in-law died. And during the fall before your father-in-law died, did you also discuss at that time the fact that he desired that the house, not the house, but the farm remain in the family? Yes. To your knowledge, did he ever take any action aside from the two acres to have the farm alienated from the family in any way? No. I'll be very, yes, mm -hmm. I'll be very brief. Um, good morning. My name is Sydney Franklin. We may have met previously. I just want to ask a few questions. How often did you actually travel to Tennessee and sit in the Harold's house? At least once a year, several times we were there, twice a year in the spring and the fall. And I believe my husband went a couple of times without me, so he was there more than I was. Okay, so over the course of 20 years, probably there 40 times, 40 days, 50 days? Days? Yes. Well, we were there for two weeks at a time, so if I was there 40 times, times that times 14 days. So you were there a little bit every year. You, you weren't privy to the conversations he had with his wife on a daily basis, were you? Well, no, I lived in Michigan. Correct. So you, while you were there, you and your husband thought it necessary to talk about the farm. We talked about the farm because we had planned on moving down there. You never did, did you? No, not until after, well, he died. So I, we both had jobs. I worked until 2020. Okay. I have no further questions, Judge. Redirect. No redirect, Your Honor. Thank you, ma'am. You may step down and have a seat in the courtroom. Your Honor, may we have a brief recess to we discuss what we're going to do the way we're going to proceed? We'll take a short recess. Uh, let's go ahead and make it our mid-morning recess for 15 minutes. Thank you. All rise. Court to recess, 15 minutes.
All rise. All right, I apologize for the delay. We had some officers who had to uh, meet with me before I could come back in. So we're, Mr. Olson, ready for your next witness. Yes, I call Ms. Linda Harrell. Linda Harrell. Mm -hmm. If you'll come up, please. You want to stand right here, turn to face the clerk, and raise your right hand, be sworn in. Right there. Yes, ma'am. You solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, tell the truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes, I do. Have a seat in that chair, speak directly into the microphone. Thank you. Oh, Ms. Harrell, my name is Mark Olson. Can you hear me okay? I've only got one ear that works. This one here is out. I, I ask that question because I have two that only work about half the time, so I understand what you're saying. But you can hear me okay? Is yes. That okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Very good. Ma'am, would you please state your full name for the court, please? Lena Gale Myers hyphen Harrell. Do you go by Linda for some reason? That was my nickname. Okay, Linda's your nickname. Is that what you were called when you and Mr. Harrell were married? Or I mean, to, I'm just saying that I've heard the name Linda. I want to make sure that it was you. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's me. Okay. Uh, you heard, did you, were you able to hear the testimony of the two previous witnesses who came before the court? Not too well. Okay, then I, I will ask you a question this way. Did your husband discuss the fact that he desired that the farm that had been in the Harrell family for so long go to his children? No. Okay. So you're saying that that just did not happen? No, it did not. Okay. Did your husband intend to disinherit his children and only leave the farm to you? He left, he, he left his children quite a bit. Yes, he was leaving the farm to me. And if I may ask you, you don't farm right now, do you? Pardon? You do not farm right now, correct? Yes, I do. Okay. What kind of farming are you doing right now? I have a hay farm. Okay. We cut okay. hay. Okay. But you don't do any of the work, right? No. Okay. No. Very good. And if we can, ma'am, you own other property also, is that correct? My children and I do. Okay. And if you would please, ma'am, how many other acres do you own in Dixon County? None in Dixon. Okay. How many other acres do you and your children own total? 75. Okay. Was it your husband's intention, you think, that the farm that had been the 100-year farm in Dixon? It calls for speculation as to what her husband's intentions were. As to what they hear the question first. Did your husband express to you that he wanted to dispossess that farm from his family and only leave it to your family? He, he, he told me, take care of the farm, honey, and it'll take care of you. Okay. Did he express the rule objection? Did he express to you that it was his desire that the farm not go to his children, but only go to you? That's right. Okay. And how did he express that? Just like I said, for me to take care of the farm and it would take care of me. Okay. So he did not say, for example, I am mad at my children and I want them not to receive the farm. I want you alone to get it. Is that correct? He wasn't mad at his children. Okay. That wasn't my question. Oh. My question was, did he say, I am mad at my children and I do not want them to get the farm or any part of it? They didn't take any interest in the farm. Did he say, ma'am, in no, his mind? Okay. No, no, Did he say, I desire to not allow the children receive anything with regards to the land? No. What is it that he said with regards to the farm? Anything other than take care of the farm, it'll take care of you? Is that it? Him and I worked on the farm together. Okay. We good. put our money on the farm together. Very good. If you would, please, ma'am, 
Can you tell the court, did you have a discussion with him about why only two acres of the farm was placed into your name? He didn't want to, he didn't want to put, put our house up uh, close to the road. He wanted to go down by the creek. And I uh, told him, I said, um, we can't raise cattle. He wanted to come out and raise cattle. And uh, he wanted to build a house down there by the creek. So he wanted to put that, our house on a small acres and then go down the creek and build us a house. I appreciate that, ma'am, but my question was this. Did he express to you a reason why only two acres of the farmland was placed into your name? Because I was buying the house with him. Was that something he said, or is that just what you think? He put that farm in a plaque. He went to his attorney and put it in a plaque. That's why Dixon allowed us to have an acre and a third to put our house on. Ma'am, I appreciate that. But my question was, did you and your husband discuss the fact that he was only putting two acres of land into your name? No. Okay. Did you, so there was no discussion, there was nothing at all about that. So we just have to glean his intent from that deed. Is that correct? He never mentioned giving the farm to the kids. So the testimony then would be that these two individuals have just come in today and they've taken an oath and they have lied. I don't know. I didn't really get to hear much what they said. Ma'am, your husband had a safe in the house, is that correct? We have a safe okay. in the house. Did you have to have that drilled and opened after he was I there? had the, I couldn't find, I was so upset I couldn't find the, the uh, my stuff was in that safe, his stuff was in that safe. So I had it open okay. a after I got a copy from Bob Jr. of the will. Ma'am, if I can, what I want to ask you about that will, I want to stay on the safe if we can right now. To open the safe, you had to have a safe company come in and drill it. Is that correct? No. Okay, what did they do? I don't know. I just asked him to open the safe. Okay. So you could not open the safe at the time you tried to open the safe, correct? I couldn't find the combination. The fact of the matter is you never had the combination, did you? Yes, I did. Okay. Well, if, if the combination was something you couldn't find, where was it that you normally kept the combination? When I lost my husband, I couldn't think of anything. Ma'am, I cannot imagine the pain that would be associated with losing a spouse. And I say that because I've never lost a spouse and I wish you my sincere condolences. But with regards to the safe itself, where is it that you maintained the combination? I had it open. Yes, ma'am. I, I, I appreciate that. I agree with you that you did not have the combination available to you, and you had a safe company come open it, correct? I think so. Okay. All right. That's good. And if you would, please, ma'am, where would you normally keep the combination? I would normally keep it uh, in my jewelry box. Does anyone after your death, after the death of your husband, have access to that jewelry box? No, 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 no. So what happened to the combination? I, I don't, I don't know. My mind, I was just terrible shape with my mind. Would it be a fair statement to say that you really never had that combination, that safe? Was I had the combination, sir. Okay. My things were in that safe. When you had the safe opened, was anyone else present at the time you had it open? Um, I don't remember. Probably this, uh, the, the uh, no, I don't think so. I think he said I opened it and I said, okay. okay. So when the safe was opened, it was just you and it was the individual from whatever company it was. Who no, he wasn't there. He just told me he opened it and he left. Very good. So when you went through things in the safe, no one else was present, correct? No. Did you take out any wills that have not been provided to the court? What I took out, no, no. What I took out, 
I looked and I saw his little blue tote. And I opened it and I saw the keys to his safe deposit box. Well, I saw his will. Bob Jr. took him three different times to give me a copy of the will. So I said, well, I'm going to look and see if I can find if Bob had a, the original will. And I took it right to my attorney at that time. Okay. If we can, ma'am, did you find any other will? Was there another will? No. Had your husband gone to another lawyer to have another will? No. Written? And you're sure of that? I know that for, for a fact. How do you know that? Because my daughter died. And I told Bob, I said, I have to get a new will, honey. Let's go up to General Motors UAW in Nashville. We have a free will. And he said, well, you go into Clarksville and get you a will. Okay. My will is fine. Okay. I said, OK. Do you agree with me that the will itself makes reference to the fact that he wanted his his discussions and the things that he had expressed followed? Yes, I, I, I would I would say he that's what that was his will. He wanted things done. And if you would please, ma'am, just so we're clear, can you articulate any reason why you think that he would not want the farm to be left to his children in any shape? I didn't understand you, honey. That's fine, and that's, I appreciate that. Can you articulate any reason why you believe your husband did not want the will to be left to his children? He didn't want his, the, the, who, I still didn't understand, honey, I'm sorry. May I have a moment, Your Honor? May. Ma'am, um, let me get back up here. We'll record it a little better. Ma'am, um, recently there was some distribution of things that were specifically uh, written out, and a number of those were missing. Do you know what happened to the items that were missing? I know exactly what happened, Tom. Tell me what happened. He went up to, ne up to Dixon on a consignment, and he sold a lot of guns. He said knives didn't sell in Tennessee like they did in Michigan. And he sold, uh, then my grandson and him went to a coin show and my grandson had a picture of him trading and selling coins. And um, I think that's mostly what was missing on the two lists. But, you know, he, but he took the money and he bought CDs, about $400,000 worth of CDs. Correct. For I, his children. Ma'am, if I can, just on the guns, where is it that you say these guns were sold, stolen? Not stolen, but sold. Pardon? Where were these guns sold? Uh, up in Dixon at the, um, um, oh, I, I, I've, I've got papers that see where he, he put them on consignment because I had some guns that I put on consignment. Very good. Ma'am, um, Tell me what happened with regards to the burial plot. Nothing has happened with the burial plot. Was there some dispute about the sale or whatever? They haven't, uh, there has been no dispute about the burial pro property. My husband bought 16 graves. He gave, he sold one to his niece. She's got a headstone there. Uh, he took two, he gave me two because I couldn't make up my mind did I want to be buried in Michigan because I there's three graves up there one for me and one for Bob okay. my mother's up there yes, so I took two and he I believe that he's met Bob Jr not Bob Jr Dale got two and I believe that that Bob Jr's getting two uh, Sherry's got two and uh, Dawn's got two and uh, I still have three left. But there hasn't been any 
um, nothing said that they weren't going to get their their grave plots. Just just one last question. I want to make sure because I want to. You're not aware of any specific conversation you had with your husband about, I don't want this farm to go to my children. No, because my husband wanted waiting for 840 to come through. That's why he had it in a plat. He was going to sell, sell Thank things. Thank you. Franklin? Clear up a few things. Um, how long were you married to your husband? 34 years. For 34 years. When did you move to Dixon County? Um, in 90, um, 2000, oh, I get a little confused. Um, 90, well, we, we, we came down in Clarksville in 96. Okay. To the, yeah. We moved that out there in, um, well, no, we came down here in 93, and we um, moved out there in 96, and we moved in the farmhouse, and um, we, we decided we we're going to build a house there, so we had to go to the Dixon board and uh, show them a plaque. So you keep saying plaque. Do you mean plat? You had to have the property surveyed? Um, I don't know what he did. Okay. But that's why Dixon County let us have an acre and a third. Okay, and let's talk a little bit about, because there are several questions about just the two acres being conveyed with your name on it as well. Did you put in your own money towards the construction of that house? Oh, absolutely. And you came into the marriage with your own money as well, correct? Yes. And did you spend your own money on the farm as well? Yes. And what type of money did you put into the farm? Hay barns, fencing, um, people with bulldozer. The farm was in terrible shape. The fencing, there was no gates. I painted uh, 28 farm gates. And you and your husband kept a lot of your finances separate, correct? To a certain degree. And that's because, can you tell me if that was because you've both been married before and you kind of just kept your assets a little bit separated? I had money before I married Bob. And, uh, and he, he got money, and uh, he had money when we got married. So he had a checking account, and I had a checking account, but we had a checking account. So you each had your own separate accounts and one joint account. So yes. it wasn't unusual for you to keep your assets separate? Yes. OK. Um, let's talk a little bit about the bank accounts at the time that he died. Yes. Did you move money over to just his account? Our account is still functioning. Uh, I had his name taken off of it because I didn't know if, if the courts would would tie that up because that was my money uh, that I ran the house with. My question is, did you move a large sum of money into one of his bank accounts with just him on it before he died? Yeah, he did. He did. He did. He, we went to the, the, the Chevy dealer in Clarksville, and he picked out a blue truck, and he had me pick out a, a cherry red uh, car, and he told Ed Groves he wants to buy me a Cadillac. I didn't want a Cadillac. I wanted a, a, a newer boat because we had an electric car, and we were going to trade our electric car and our Avalanche truck as soon as General Motors made them. So I was giving him my allowance, my extra money. He was putting money in there. We were putting our cattle money in there. And uh, it had over 100000 in it, but he put it in his account by a mistake. So he put it into his account, and his children got that money as well as the CDs, Yes, and correct? they also got his uh, IRA, and um, they got a lot of CDs. He provided for his children as Absolutely. well. You know, his children would come down. Um, Bob Jr. would come down maybe once every two or three years, and they liked to take pictures of old farms. That's what they liked to do. And Bob would drive them around because he had some old farm, old farm, old hay farms, old cattle farms that, uh, and uh, they wouldn't stay with us. They would go visit their friends 
Uh, in fact, it was Bob's niece's ex-husband they would go visit. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you there for just a second so we can get back on track a little bit. Um, was your husband close to his children? No. Did he speak to them very often? He never went up there to see them. Did he speak with them on the phone? Yeah, once in a while, Bob Jr. and him would talk about guns or something, and uh, Sherry would come down. And that's his other year. daughter. That's a daughter. She would come down to, uh, before this bad, uh, sick, bad flu come out, and she would come down once a year, and he would give her $400 to go shopping, and her and I would go shopping. Okay. So you had a good relationship with his children. Yes, I try. I was very good. I was a very good stepmother. And you're close with their children, their grand, his grandchildren. He wasn't close to his grandchildren. He was close to my grandchildren. He loved my grandchildren. Okay, and let's talk about the farm a little bit. You made a statement earlier that said, your husband told you, if you take care of the farms, they'll take care of you. What did you think he meant by that? That meant for me to keep the farms because he was waiting for 840 to come in. He said he wasn't going to sell any of his farm right now. He just sold a piece to David, and David sold it to the kids that built that new house up there, and they ended up renting the farmhouse for a year from Bob okay. while they were building their house. So you always believed that your husband was going to leave you the farm? Absolutely. I have no further questions, Judge. So you maintain separate bank accounts, is that correct? Yes. And the money that you had, you said you came into the marriage with money. Did that come from your previous marriages? Yes. Okay. Well, I worked. I understand. What did you do for a living, ma'am? What did I do? I worked for Seven Up Ball and Company for 16 years, and then I was a custodian. Uh, I left and my, um, I lost a, a, a pension by coming to Tennessee. I told Bob, we're going to need that little 10 year pension. He says, no, you've got my pension. And, uh, and I, we just come down here. My family's all in Michigan. Just so we're clear, you, you maintain separate bank accounts. Where was your bank account? Where was it? Yeah, what bank was it? It was the uh, same bank account Bob's was, okay. M -M um, Regents. I think you testified that you have separate bank accounts and then there was a joint bank account, is that yes. correct? Yes. Okay. And your money was kept separate from Bob's money, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And you would put money in jointly to the joint bank account, is that correct? Yes. Very good. And when you bought a car, was the car in your name or both names? Both names. Okay. And if you can, please, ma'am, tell me, your other land, when did you receive the other land? When did I receive it? I bought it when we was up in Michigan. Were you all married at that point? Yes. So you bought separate land while you were in Michigan, and he obtained separate land too. Is that correct? Um, when when Miss Hattie died, Bob and his mother and dad bought the home farm, but Bob bought 29 acres at Batson Mill. And at that time, Bob could have put his children on that piece of land, but he didn't. And he could have put your name on it too, right? He didn't put nobody's name on it. He didn't put a he didn't put anybody's name on it, and he put in the will, do what I have said, correct? Pardon? He he put in the will, follow my instructions, correct? Whatever the will said, that's what he said. Now you say he wasn't close to his own children, but they would come down. Are you disputing the fact that they would come down for two weeks at a time? No, they never stayed two weeks at a time. Okay. They wouldn't even they wouldn't even stay with us. They went and seen their friends. Now Sherry would stay with us, and her and I would go shopping. And you think that uh, you think that your husband <coughs> had a greater desire to provide for your grandchildren than his own? <coughs> Well, he was just close to my grandchildren. My grandchildren <coughs> was around Bob since they were babies, and he was good to my grandchildren. Now, you said something about cars and joint money and that kind of thing, and you've referenced Ed Groves. Yeah. Uh, how long ago was that? Oh, let's see. Well, let's see. Bob's going to be gone almost two years. And we were going to look at new cars and new trucks. 
oh, probably that same year that he died. He died in 2000, uh, uh, 2023, and uh, it, it was very close. We just built that, that saving account up. I'm not trying to challenge this too much, but if you would, Ed Groves ran a Cadillac place in Clarksville, Tennessee for a long time. Well, a long time. Yeah. And that I, I didn't go to, no, he sold that long time ago. This one was in Clarksville, brand new. Well, it wasn't brand new, but it had been there. Okay. And do you, do you recall, for example, what the dealership was? Your Honor, at this point, I'm going to object to the relevance of this what and what this relevance? has to do with the world. It has to do with memory. Or it has to do with her recollection and memory. Sustained, I don't think this is really relevant. Okay. But in terms of buying the car, can you tell me when you bought the car? In Dixon? No. And, 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 and let's see, Alexander, which is another name now. Very good. Very we got, good. it was only one electric car. And uh, they promised Bob, because we bought a lot of trucks from them. Very good, very good. And if we can, ma'am, just so we're clear again, you don't recall ever any recollection of the conversations that this gentleman and this lady said took place with regards to the farm going to his children, correct? That just never took place. Would you repeat that? Sure. You don't recall any conversation about the farm going to his children? No, absolutely not. Nothing else for her. Ms. Harrell, let me just make sure I'm understanding. You, you mentioned a couple of times that there were CDs and a, another bank account and an IRA. Uh, where were these CDs that you've mentioned? They were in four different banks. I would run around and find what interest rates would be, and uh, that would help him, and I'd find the best deal that he could find on his CD. And a lot of them was, it was just right here in, in, uh, in Clarksville. And you said, if I understood you, you said there were, um, there was like $400,000 worth of CDs that his children got? Yes. Okay, and were they in his, in their, his name and their name, or how did they, how did they end up with the CDs? It was in his name and their beneficiary. All right, so he established CDs totaling somewhere around $400,000 that had his name and his children's name on them. Yes. And he did that. How, when did he start doing that? Um, I don't know, because we had a, we did a few CDs when we were in Michigan. And um, I had CDs um, would be in my name and my children, but nothing, nothing like that. Uh, we raised cattle and, and we, we, he would get the cattle money. And it was my cattle too, because I have a record of me given Papa Benny the money for the for the bulls and the cows. So anything that went on that farm, cows, fences, um, I donated my money too. You and he worked this farm together then? Yes. Okay. And you mentioned an IRA. Was that an IRA that he had through his retirement? Yes. And and were they the beneficiaries, his children the beneficiaries of that? Yes. You know how much was in that IRA? Forty-six thousand. It was. It went down every year. All right. And then there was mention of this hundred thousand dollars in the bank account in his name only that uh, was intended to buy a truck and a and you a car. Yes. What happened to that hundred thousand? The kids got it. And is that because their name was a survivor? On, yeah, on his checking account. Okay. All right. Anything else? No, Your Honor. Thank you, ma'am. You may step down and have a seat. Thank you. Mr. Olson, you're still putting on your case. Do you have another witness? We do not, but I would ask, Your Honor, we have got a motion that said, oh, I'll let this nice lady come by. She don't want to crowd you. It's awful to have only one ear. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. We have two motions that are pending uh, for fees for Mr. Harrell when he was the executor and then the R fees. Uh, council has opposed those. I don't mind just submitting them to the court. You want to just submit them to the court? I'll have to review them, obviously. That would be I fine. I think there's been an objection filed they filed a response objection. filed by, the, um, by Ms. Harrell and her attorney. They have. They have filed an objection. Right. Uh, but we would have no other proof today. 
Well, we're going to talk about fees as well, Your Honor. There's still an order that's awarded to me, my fees in defending the will contest, and I have not received my fees yet. So do you have any other proofs that you want to offer? No, Your Honor. No. Ms. Brown, I know you're the administrator. You actually may be represented by Ms. Franklin. Is that correct? Not officially. I think I'm here in a neutral position. Let me see what happens here. All right. Thank you. Well, if that's all the proof, I'll hear you in argument. Your Honor, I'd like to, if we could, request, I will tell you, we did not realize this was set for today, and we should have. I experienced some difficulty with my email, and counsel was kind enough to call me yesterday. It was the only way that I knew we were doing this today. We had gotten an email from your court officer saying it had been moved. We thought it was on the 20th, so we scurried around, got everything done. I appreciate Mr. Harrell coming down here. But in light of that, I'd like to waive the argument and just submit a written proposal, if we might, if that would be acceptable to the court. Your written proposal is to make your argument in writing? Is that essentially it? Yeah, just I'd propose findings of fact. Judge, I think that you're more than qualified to make findings of fact and conclusions of law today. I mean, we've already— I don't think I'm required to make the findings of fact. I don't think I need anything else to hear in this case, so I'm prepared to rule. Okay. You will— I'd waive argument. The court has previously cited a case law that was submitted, and I have relied upon at least portions of my ruling earlier in this particular situation. And this is no longer a will contest because, obviously, the will contest was dismissed by the court, and therefore it is, in fact, a hearing to determine the construction of the will that is in question. And it really boils down to essentially the interpretation of what his intentions were for certain provisions of his will. Certainly, as Mr. Olson has pointed out, it's a little bit of an unusual will in the way it's drawn, a little different than perhaps we would have done it in the state of Tennessee or when I was drawing wills. But nonetheless, it does provide for a distribution of his property. So the question becomes, how do you interpret a provision of his property under these wills? And what the articles that are in question are, number one, section article five, a specific devise of tangible personal property. And I would simply say that he identifies in article one his family, that his spouse is Lena Gail Myers Harrell. His children are Robert Harrell and living in Michigan, Dale Harrell living in Southside, Sherry Mingres living in Trenton, Michigan, and Dawn Combleviz, I'm sorry, in Taylor, Michigan. So he identifies his spouse and his children. And he just goes on to talk about appointing his son and his daughter to his co-personal representatives to administer the will. And then he directs that the distribution of his property beginning in article five, section one says the following, I give all of my tangible personal property, not otherwise specifically mentioned, together with any insurance policies covering any tangible personal property and claims under such policies to my spouse. Couldn't be clearer. He goes on to say that if my spouse does not survive me, then I direct that said property be divided into equal shares, one share each for a child of mine who survives me, and so forth. So he made provision for his personal property to be divided among his children if his spouse, go to his spouse, if his spouse didn't survive, then they would go to his children in equal shares. Article six, distribution of the residue, section one, I give the residue of my estate, whether real, personal, or mixed, to my spouse. So, you know, it's section one, very clear. He gives the residue, whatever was left in his estate besides the personal property, which included all real property in his name, to his spouse. And it goes on to say that if his spouse does not survive him, then it would be directed in equal shares to his children. So 
Um, the confusion that's argued is set forth in section seven. And at section seven of this will says division of property. If two or more beneficiaries are entitled to an equal share or percentage of property distributed by the terms of my will, then I direct them to divide the property among themselves as they may agree. The next sentence says, and this is the source of the confusion and argument, I request that they honor any intentions with regard to the distribution of this property that I may have expressed prior to my death. And then it goes on to say, if substantially equal divisions of the property cannot be agreed upon within a reasonable time after my death, then I direct my personal representative to divide the property and distribute it in substantially equal shares or to sell the property and distribute the proceeds in equal shares. <clears throat> and that is the section that, in my opinion, uh, creates a problem. Article 9, Section 1 says, Upon my death, I direct my personal representative to look for a handwritten list signed by me, which requires the distribution of certain specifically named personal effects to the person or persons named. If such a list is not found and identified by my personal representative within 30 days after my will is admitted to probate, all property shall be distributed in accordance with this will. Now, there was a handwritten uh, series of handwritten uh, forms here on the top uh, attached to this will, written in green ink that identifies jewelry, uh, weapons, it identifies coins, uh, knives, guitars, personal clothes, tools, and so forth. All of that was identified in, in his list. So the question becomes is how do you interpret those two together? And as I've stated before, as, and I'll repeat some of the case law that, that deals with this, that the uh, cardinal rule of construction of all wills is that the court shall seek to discover the intention of the testator and give effect to it unless it contravenes some rule of law or public policy. The testator's intention is to be ascertained from the particular words used in the will itself, from the context in which those words are used, and from the general scope and purposes of the will, read in the light of surrounding and attending circumstances. And then lastly, uh, we are not to permitted, we are not permitted to undertake an examination of what a testator is supposed to have intended. That is citing the Presley case at 782 Southwest 2nd at 488. Also cites Strictly versus Carmichael, the Tennessee Supreme Court at 850 Southwest 2nd, 127. <clears throat> Recognizing a testator has the absolute right to have his property disposed of according to his discretion, we must attempt to construe a will so that every word and every clause contained therein is given effect. It is this court's opinion that proof in this case has established the following, that Mr. Harrell and his wife, um, or Mr. Harrell in particular, owned an interest in this farm and this property prior to the execution of this will uh, in 1992, I think is what it, I'm looking at it. Uh, the date of the will is on the 8th of 1990, April of 1990, that he owned an interest in the real property, may not have owned it outright, but he owned an interest in the real property prior to the execution of this will. And there is no mention of his intention to leave to his children any interest in this farm that had been in the family for a hundred years. In addition to that, the court is of the opinion that the proof is established that Mr. and Mrs. Harrell moved from the state of Michigan to the state of Tennessee, began residing here in the early 1990s, and that they lived on the farm and that they together worked the farm, that they uh, jointly invested their money into the farm, that they jointly worked the farm and building a house and building barns and so forth and had a cattle operation according to all of the evidence before me and that the two of them, as husband and wife, worked the farm together. Um, as a result of that, <clears throat> when considering how this farm was to be divided, uh, the court finds it quite credible that he intended for the farm to take care of Miss Harrell if she took care of the farm because they had worked it together, albeit that it was a family farm and it had been in the family for many generations. Nonetheless, uh, it is not reasonable to this court to say that that 
single language in that sentence in Article 7, that one sentence saying, I request that they honor an intention with regard to the distribution of the property means that we are supposed to set aside the clear language of the will um, and instead insert uh, the supposed con uh, the, the conversations where there was some conversation about that, uh, the will, I'm sorry, the, the form itself. Clearly, Mr. Harrell loved his children. Clearly, he wanted to take care of and provide for them. And he did so in providing what amounted to, a, by my calculation, over a half a million dollars worth of, of uh, inheritance that they received from the various uh, efforts he made during his marriage to Mrs. Harrell to provide for his children. He provided for them monetarily. He provided for her, in this court's opinion, by uh, continuing the farm to be in her possession. If she would take care of the farm, the farm would take care of her. That makes sense to this court. When I consider the argument about that one sentence being in, this, in that, I read Article 7 to um, deal more directly with personal property division than anything else because it says, if two or more beneficiaries are entitled to an equal share or percentage of property distributed by terms of my will, then I direct them to divide the property among themselves as they may agree. If they can't agree, the next sentence comes into play. I request that they honor my intentions with regard to the distribution of this property that I may have expressed prior to my death. In other words, he's saying, I want you to try to come up with an agreement as to how to divide the property and I'm asking that you consider my intentions at the time that may have been discussed in division of those assets. But it goes on to say that if you can't substantially agree, then you basically would have to have it uh, distributed or sold or divided property and distributed in a substantial equal. I don't think that one sentence in that particular paragraph creates any confusion or <clears throat> that it creates any um, issue that would say that we are now supposed to uh, somehow contravene the clear language of his will by uh, saying that because he made some statement in the years past about how the will, how the farm should pass or stay in the family, that that, uh, that one sentence would allow me to apply that to contravene the will. So the other thing I would simply point out is, is that Mr. Harrell had the ability at any point in time, if he chose to do so, to convey uh, the interest in this farm to his children. Um, he could have reserved a life estate for that 140 acres and, and conveyed it to his children with a life estate. He certainly had enough business wherewithal to create the CD accounts with them as the beneficiary and that uh, checking account by placing them as the beneficiary, which in this court's mind clearly indicates that he intended for them to be taken care of financially because he loved them. Might not have seen them as often as he'd like, but he did care for them and, and wanted to provide for them, and that he has done so. And he cared for his wife for 34 years, wanted to provide for her by the farm. And that is the court's ruling. This, uh, this, my, my ruling is, is that there is no confusion in the provisions of the will, that the will is to be given effect, and that she has received under that residue clause, uh, which I think was section four, the entirety of, of the remainder of the estate other than what was specifically mentioned in uh, the will itself. Ms. Uh, Franklin will draw the order on that. I will consider your uh, both of your requests for ruling on the fees that have been incurred both by the administrator and by the attorneys involved, and I will give you a ruling on those requests uh, at a later date. Anything further? No. All right, we stand adjourned. All right.